Okay, so let's go ahead and wrap up <clears throat> the last of our macroinvertebrates that we are likely to find when we're doing our stream work. Uh, please keep in mind, this is not a full all-inclusive list. Uh, there's plenty of other macroinvertebrates that are not on the list. These are just some of the most common ones. Um, and as we started, the first ones were the most sensitive to pollution. The second group was somewhat sens sensitive. And then as we got into the hemiptera here, the true bugs, these guys are tolerant of pollution. Um, the true flies or midges, as they're often called, known as the order diptera, these are also going to be tolerant to um, pollution as well. So diptera, the true flies or the midges, winged terrestrial insect. These are often those little clouds of things we call the gnats. They're, a lot of times they're actually midges flying above the water as adults. They spend a lot of time as in this form in the aquatic environment and then go morph into the adult version or adult form. And sometimes they're only adults for about two or three weeks, reproduce, they die. But when they're up there and you get these big swarms of these things, that's a lot of food for a lot of terrestrial animals. So keep that in mind. When you're in the water for part of your life, you're part of that food chain. And then when you go to the, to the land-based environment, you become part of the land-based food chain. So lots of these species play incredibly important ecological roles. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, how do we identify a nymph? Well, let's take a look at some of the key features of the true flies or midges. Uh, usually they have a very plump, <clears throat> excuse me, let me, there it is. Um, they have a plump, kind of fat segmented body plan where they, they almost look like a little caterpillar, believe it or not. Uh, they will have a definitive head region. And they often have fleshy projections at the hind end. Um, and if you flip them over, a lot of times, the digestive system is visible through the skin. They often are green or grayish or, you know, the they're not really attractive looking creatures, but you can see this dark line running down the length of their body that is the digestive system. So if you guys have ever had shrimp that you had to cook and peel, there's that dark line down the bottom of the shrimp, that's the digestive system. We can see the same thing in these guys. So again, any kind of grub looking little thing, odds are those are members of Diptera. The true flies. Uh, they tend to be in slower moving water. So again, it depends on where we're sampling in the river. We may find these if we're near the shore in a pocket where the water is really slow. Uh, if we were to sample a little stagnant pool of water, we're more likely to find midges in there versus a fast flowing water. Um, they're detritivores. They just feed off of the bottom organic material. And again, they are tolerant to pollution, which is why we can find these guys in stagnant pools of water where we would not find helgramets or stone flies or even those fish flies or some of the other things that are somewhat sensitive to pollution. Now, because they're there, again, it doesn't mean the water is bad. But if this is the only thing we find, then that's probably an indication the water is bad. Okay, last group to mention, the detritus worms. Now, this is actually at the phylum level because there's so much diversity here. Uh, we're at the phylum clitolata. That's the broad phylum level. Um, and when we look at these guys, they're aquatic their entire lives. Um, we wouldn't really truly say nymph feature, but juvenile feature of the aquatic worms. <clears throat> they tend to be segmented. Let me get this up here. Oop. Segmented body plan. They're elongated. 
and they have round bodies. Um, they basically resemble earthworms. They are not earthworms, though. These are detritus worms. They're completely aquatic. Earthworms are terrestrial based. You can't put an earthworm in water and keep it there forever. It will drown. So these guys, completely aquatic, eating detritus, stuff off the bottom. Um, they, again, tend to be in quiet waters where there's a lot of silt and decaying organic material. So if you're on the edge in a little pocket and you're scooping up some of the muck off the bottom, don't be surprised if you have detritus worms in there. They are also tolerant to pollution levels. So they can handle pollution in the aquatic environment. So, Okay, so we got an idea of what we should be looking for. Now what I want to talk about is the sampling method. So that way when you guys get down there, you already know what we're going to be doing. You got a basic feel for how this works. So what you're looking at here, this is a Saboon River. This is a group that I had years ago when we sampled. We're going to be doing the exact same thing. One of the main sampling techniques is using a thing called the kick seine. That's this big mesh net, this yellow net, and then there's a pole on each side of the net. So I'm going to go to the next picture because it'll be easier to draw on that one. But this takes a team of at least three people, if not more, to properly work and do a good collection. All right, so let's look at the next slide. These are all pictures from the river. So I want you guys to get a feel for what this river is going to look like. So when we're there, you're like, oh, I remember this from the lecture. Okay, so here's another shot of it. Now this year, the water level was a lot higher because it was raining a lot. Hit or miss, we don't know what's going to happen. But the way kick seining works, you get two people to plant the net. So you put a pole on this side and you plant the net all the way down to the bottom of the water. Use the other pole, plant, oh, through my back. There we go. Plant the net at the bottom of the water and then your net is sitting here. Now this person will walk upstream in front of the net and then start moving downstream, kicking up rocks, turning things over, basically stirring everything up so that way everything that gets washed off the rocks and stirred up flows downstream into the net and gets collected in the net. The net's there to collect any particle floating in the water within a certain size. So again, the key is that we call this person the kicker, put a big K on their back for kicker. They need to go upstream from the net, move into the current that will wash it straight down into the net. Don't get in front of the net and walk upstream because you're disturbing everything. Wait until you get about 30 to 40 feet upstream from the net before you move directly into the current that will bring the debris down to the net. So the two people holding the net, wait until the kicker reaches them, and then you lift the entire net up and out of the water. Let me draw another picture here. And what you're gonna have is, here's your pole, here's your other pole, across the center of the net, you're gonna, here's your net, this is the net, and you're gonna have all sorts of little invertebrates and all sorts of stuff trapped in the net if everything went well. Now you need to carry this net like a stretcher, carry it to the shore, lay it down on the shore, and then start sorting through everything. You'll have tweezers, just look for stuff that's moving. Grab it, throw it in a jar. Now, when you're sorting, when you're collecting on the shore, Let me draw your net. So hold, ignore that person for right now. Your net is laying on the shore here. What I will want you guys to do is go through and pick out everything. When you're at the river, start sorting the things you're picking out. Oh, I think this is a Helgramith. That cup. I, 
Give them all their own cups because they will eat each other. They will eat everything. Oh, I think this is a Dobson fly. This is a May fly. This is a damsel fly. Go for tails. Look for butts. How many tail fins on the butt? Three, two, or zero? Sort that way. So if you start sorting based on tail fins or lack of, you're already organizing them. So it makes it a whole lot easier when we get back. So you can create one cup, two tail fins, another cup, three tail fins, another cup, the weird looking things, another cup, the big scary things, another cup, rocky stony things, another cup. Oh, well, that's got three. It could go into this cup. No big deal. Or if you're good enough, here's the three tail feathers. So when we're sitting on that riverbank sorting this stuff, the more we sort it into the cups, the easier it is when we get back to the station and we lay all this stuff out on the tables and we actually start identifying what things are <clears throat> and we start organizing and categorizing and putting them into their collective groups. Um, so that's the method we're going to be using. The other main method that we can use, so some other people in the group, can actually walk the edge of the, the river and do collecting by hand. Simply turn over a rock. Look, what do you see? Brush it off into a cup. Can you grab some of these things by hand? It's an easy way to collect. It's not as accurate, doesn't give you as robust of a sample size, but it does help. So we get three or four people into the water, into the current, and then we get a couple people on the shore for each group and then we'll get a big sample size. So we're going to collect as individual groups. We'll break up into three groups, three teams, but then we'll aggregate all of that data together. That's gonna to be a big thing. You need to get data from everybody. We want one big master data set that is shared by everybody in the class. So don't just, oh, I'm gonna write up my research based on the 30 things I found, you're going to add your data to the other two groups and look at the bigger sample size. Now, once we get our data, we want to look at tolerance scores. And what does this mean? And how does this work? And what information can we gain from this? So hold on one second here. So this is the document in Blackboard called Fundamentals of Freshwater Ecology. Please look over this before you go. Bring a copy, whether you have a digital or you have a physical, I would do both, copy of this so you guys have this on hand. It's giving us all the instructions on how to do the abiotic sampling, the chemical measurements, but then it also will be important, I'm going to zoom down here, because it has the data tables that we need to fill out to determine what's going on with the macroinvertebrates. So you guys are going to fill this out when you're in Belize. This is going to be an important thing for you to be able to do your write-up when you get back. This is, in, in a sense, your lab sheet for this exercise or for this activity. You need to get all this data collected in Belize. Don't try to do it from memory when you come home. Okay, so we collect all of these specimens, and then we're going to look at a tolerance score. Now, what you're going to do here is indicate, all right, did I find any of these guys? Check, check, check. Oh, I found some of these, found some of those, found those, I found those, etc. And what you're going to do is you do a multiplier here. So let's say you found four stoneflies, two mayflies, two water pennies. So how many of these species, how many species are represented here? Three species times three. You got a multiplier of nine. Don't go four, six, eight. It's how many species were collected. We found three species here. Oh, that should be nine there. Sorry about that. Let me erase. Okay. 
All right, and I'm going to wrap this up in the next lecture. It'll only take a couple minutes, but I want to make sure you guys know what we're doing with this. It's going to make your lives easier when you're doing your write-up.